welcome to the first research methods podcast called the other research methods with uh, Vittorio Sajomo and my name is hey. Brook. and in this uh, podcast we actually want to discuss the research methods which we cannot learn in a curriculum like this course is part of a chemistry cur curriculum and these episodes will be part of a research methods uh, course. So we want to give you an idea to watch your individual proposal. Uh, this should be not a step-by-step -step approach how to do uh, your individual project. It's more our thoughts and some topics to help you to get started. Today's topic is creativity. So let's first start with an introduction of ourselves and also our level of creativity in research. Vito, do you want to start? Yes, so uh, most of the students will already know me. Um, well, half of the students already know me. Um, Vittorio Sajomo, and I'm an assistant professor in the group of Bionanotechnology. Um, I like creativity. Uh, I'm probably not that good at that, but I'm always aiming for uh, simplicity, for making something more simple. Um, I love a lot of technology, so I try to combine technology and chemistry, that it's the background or my background, and also a little bit of art, so how to combine art and science, making something more beautiful or more artistic. And you? Yes, so my name is Julia. Some students might know me from the nanomedicine course, where I teach uh, on multimodal contrast agents in MRI. Uh, I'm also an assistant professor at BioNanotechnology, and my research is on ultra high field uh, magnets for uh, MRI applications. My level of creativity, yeah, in research, we, we try to uh, get the maximum out of this ultra high field. But in general, in research, I'm quite structured. So that is sometimes a bit the bottleneck towards creativity, because when you're very structured, uh, yeah, it leaves sometimes little room for creativity, so you have to be careful for that. But I, I really like music, I play piano and uh, to do art, so some painting. And from that part, I'm trying to combine a bit more this uh, creative part with the research part. So let's start with the first topic, which is around why do we need creativity in science? And if we look at the definitions, for instance, the Merriam-Webster dictionary states creativity as the ability to create, but I'm not sure if that uh, definition is uh, that sufficient yet. So for instance, the Cambridge dictionary says ability to produce or use original and unusual ideas and synonyms, which I think are very essential to creativity are originality, imagination, vision and ingenuity. Peter, what would you think? What is the most important aspect here? I love the word ingenuity because it means uh, that, that, that that's one that uh, actually resonates with me. That's uh, that's 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 quite nice. Um, yeah. Yes. What is creativity? I don't think that you can say, OK, if I build uh, an IKEA chair, that's creativity for me, especially in science it's about uh, making a leap forward. So doing something that, or seeing something that 99% of the other people didn't see it before. And that's the difference between making incremental research in which you are building something on someone else's research and just a little bit forward, which is also fine. Eh? We need this in research, yeah. but the real Creativity, it's about making a huge leap forward. So doing something that no one has ever done before and opening a new field, for example, or doing something in another way that no one ever did it before. That's so, for me why we need creativity in, in science. So for you, the unusual is also a very big part. I, uh, I understand. Definitely. Yeah. I'm yeah, a big fan I of think, the unusual. Um, for me, I think the imagination is something I really deeply uh, connect with the uh, creativity. So kind yeah. of to use your imagination. Yeah. Yeah, actually, there was an interesting uh, blog from the Donders Institute in Nijmegen from Marisha Manahova already a time ago, which because we always think about creativity as something needed for the initial research idea, mostly, I would say. But uh, uh, the blog is about that you don't only need it in the research question, but actually along all the stages of science. 
So I, I think I agree with that because to have a very creative idea and then just go on with a plan to step by step work on it, I think that is not uh, that's not truly creativity. I think we need to implement it indeed in all um, research areas. That's but I guess, definitely. I guess that here at this in this blog we focus mainly again on the research question because that's the assignment of the student to come up with a new creative research question. Definitely. But then when they will go in the lab and they have to solve a problem, they must be creative. Yes, yes, that's definitely. And that we can do in the practicals, actually. So Exactly. Indeed. <laughs> uh, do you agree with these above definitions or is there something very crucial you would add to them? I will say that I told you, I mean, it's the difference between incremental and, and leap forwards. Um, just creating for creating sake is not that that um, creative uh, yeah. there is one sentence from harry ford that probably he never say that, that if you ask people what they want they will say uh, faster horses mm -hmm. instead of creating a car because they simply don't know what a car is um, ah that's that's a very interesting one yeah so if you ask for money to for, for doing science and you prepare something really weird they probably will not give you the money because they want something else yeah, that's, that's, that's often uh, with fundamental research, right? You you ask Indeed. for money, which is not very, uh, you cannot project yet what you will get out of it. But that could yeah. be an interesting other episode, actually, to talk more about <laughs> fundamental research. Definitely. What do you consider a big creative step uh, in science? Poof, that's, that's really difficult to say. And that's because, I mean, from my point of view, I cannot really have a vision of what creativity will be in the future. I need to read the paper and say, oh, this is something I never thought about it. This is so simple that I should have thought about it. This is a beautiful creative paper. So uh, I cannot so you, really... Be... So you think that creativity is something you can only evaluate backwards looking, let's say. I think so. Because okay. if you can do it uh, forward, then it's not really something that uh, no one sees, but it's something that you are uh, predicting. Ah, that's very yeah. interesting, because that probably also need, means that if we have 10 creativity, creative ideas, only two will be judged like creative from backwards <clears throat> evaluation, right? I think there are uh, there are exceptions. So Feynman, so nanotechnology. I don't know how many years before uh, the the word nanotechnology was even there. Uh, so those are uh, visionary people. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think for me, um, a good example of creativity, maybe not in the idea, but are the air first airplanes, because. Uh, there was always this dream and this vision and you had these role models, right? The birds were basically the role models for the airplanes. But there were so many creative ideas along the way to realize these airplanes and each of them had this goal, but the, the approach was very creative. And now we have helicopters and we have normal airplanes all came because people approached it differently. Yeah, definitely. Then uh, the next question, you mentioned Feynman. So uh, do you have a role model for creativity? Is there something you say, someone you say, okay, that was a really creative uh, person? So I think that uh, many of our students will not know who MacGyver is or was. Uh, that was a TV series from the 80s, but he had always to solve problem with the really little amount of things that he could combine. Mm -hmm. And he was always finding a solution for, uh, for doing stuff. So that's fictional, obviously, but I think that in the 80s and probably in the 90s, there were many TV shows for um, for creative thinking and for solving problem or for problem solving. Uh, you had Indiana Jones, you had uh, Goonies, you had a lot of different shows where kids were solving problems. I think I was, uh, I grew up with that. So you say in the 80s, uh, in the 80s, if I uh, may ask, but do you think it was kind of also a, a, a we have a German word for it, zeitgeist, uh, like the spirit of, of the time? I think so. Do you miss uh, that uh, maybe nowadays uh, or? I don't know. I was, uh, I, I grew up with that, so I'm not entirely sure if I miss it, but um, I have no idea if, I mean, for sure I changed. I don't know if also the TV shows change. I'm not entirely sure, but that's my feeling of growing up with 
people that were solving problem with the, the the least amount of stuff that they can find yeah um, science wise again i don't know if all the students know but george whitesides uh living scientist is one of my um, role model because he practically invented many different fields um, with this group so it's not mm -hmm. that he is fixated with one single field but he opened a lot of different things he started the microfluidics with PDMS, uh, when everyone was using glass, he said, okay, let's use another material and make it simple, easy for other people to use. Then he went on with surface chemistry, then he went on with soft robotics. He started a lot of different fields practically by himself or well, his group, but the idea and how he creatively opened the field for me, it's um, impressive. Oh yeah, yeah, indeed. And do you have some um, role model for creativity? Yeah, I, I don't have a very specific role model, but I really like the scientists uh, before science was uh, clustered into the disciplines. So for instance, Da Vinci, he was both an engineer and an artist. And I think that was really um, a yeah, nice approach that if you can work in all the different disciplines and you, you're naturally moving in all of these disciplines because the disciplines basically did not exist at the time yet and now often we are we are in our discipline and it takes more effort to switch between them of course it's also uh, the disciplines themselves are quite complex but i think it, it it's really nice when you can equally move in all of these different disciplines and really get this cross uh, disciplinary approach so you are saying that we are going to over specialize uh, rather than uh, opening uh, different ideas from somewhere else in in the field yeah i think over specialization i mean of course there's <clears throat> limited time in the curricula but it it stays uh, uh yeah it stays yeah maybe not a problem because you also need the specialization but sometimes these uh, opening up approaches i mean for instance with the minors nowadays that you can easily go to a different uh, minor to learn about a different topic. I think those uh, initiatives are very useful. Or also we had a few years ago, these art and science collaborations at yeah. our university. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really, that opens up your mind so differently than any uh, yeah, collaboration within science even can, because um, from that experience, I worked with uh, art students on a project and they were asking so different ideas, which which never occurred to me to ask these questions. And that really opened up my mind a lot. So I think those, those uh, uh, scientists in that time, which could really switch between the, the different fields, that's really amazing to me. So maybe you want to learn some organic chemistry rather than magnetic resonance? Yeah, maybe at some point, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> could be useful for me to learn more about organic chemistry, but... Uh, mm. Yeah. Okay, that was uh, that was it. Um, if then, we, okay. yeah, if we go uh, to the second, so we talked about why we need creativity. I think that was quite uh, quite interesting about, uh, especially from you, that you say to make the big changes. Let's say to make the fundamental changes. But then more for the students now. So, what are techniques for creativity? How how should they come up with these creative ideas for their proposals? Yeah. That's a, a very difficult question. And this is actually why we're doing this podcast, I guess. Uh, it's because you cannot teach creativity. And you can have few exercises, but they are not really useful. And that's because everyone can learn creativity by themselves. So my personal mm -hmm. point, my personal point of view, eh? I'm not saying that this is going to work for everyone else. Um, but sometimes I need to feel in a situation where I need to use creativity. And nowadays, most of the cases is when I don't get money for doing the research that I want. So nice. I need to get uh, other ways for doing the, the idea that I had in mind. So either by using 3D printing or by using Arduino or without uh, super expensive instruments that I don't have in the lab. So I must get creative there. Mm -hmm. That's one point. Uh, the second point is that you should always have your eyes open for something unexpected and you don't throw away something that doesn't work just because it doesn't work. So this is, for example, the cases with the, the, the 3D printed Lycurgus cup I that's know. coming from, uh, from a student in, uh, in um, 
uh, in the introduction course that we had. So the experiment failed because it didn't get the, that was Lars, it didn't get the, the, the red particles, uh -huh. but it didn't throw them away just because it didn't work. He saw something interesting, then came to, to, to me and say, oh, look, this is, this is weird, what happened? And then from there, we, we got three, three papers out. So pay attention and keep your eyes open also for something unexpected. So the unexpected sometimes it's nicer than if an experiment just work. Yes, yes, indeed. So actually, but you say you cannot learn creativity, we cannot teach creativity, but you could uh, expose yourself, right? When you say it's situations, you could train yourself or somehow expose yourself to these situations in order to... Yes. And this is so, also why, we, for the minor, this is how we try to, to make the, the practicals. Yes. So giving them either uh, wrong, um, uh, how to make the experiment in a wrong way, uh, how they need to solve the problem, how to need to use arts and craft for doing stuff. Uh, this is we, what we can do as a teacher. We can expose them to an environment which can stimulate creativity and also we are not going to punish them if the experiment didn't work because this yeah. is also important in, in creativity process we need to uh, teach that failed experiment happen i mean most of the time in research 90 percent of the time things are not going to work as you want yes but then okay. so then the lesson would be to to stop and to uh, reflect either how you can Definitely. do it differently how you could even uh, yeah, uh, your main point is actually, I think that's how, how could you do it next time differently? We're doing in this discussion of the practical reports, but I think your point is also like, how can we change maybe the application if we get a different, uh, observe a different phenomenon, for instance, right? Definitely. Yeah. So that one, and I have also one last point um, mm -hmm. that it's for me connecting dots. So you don't have to have a compartmentalized memory. If you learn something, you can always use it for something else. So if you learn crochet, maybe you can think, OK, uh, what happens if I now do an exponential crochet? So instead of making one point, I make an exponential every time. What happens? During my PhD, we had a Friday experiment, which you can do whatever experiment you want. And also if you have a crazy idea, like, can we run a reaction in beer? Because I was in Germany, so yes. <laughs> that, was the, that was the topic. Which kind of reaction will work in beer instead of other, another solvent? And which beer did uh, you use? Because the, in Germany, you have like regional differences in beer, so... The plop, of course. Okay. Yes. Um, so when you learn something, don't compartmentalize somewhere in your brain and use it only for that. So if you have a hobby, try to use your hobby for your work. If you learn something at work, try to use it for your hobby and, and so on. So I try to that, mix stuff. I guess that very well links back to this uh, discussion in uh, to the researchers like Da Vinci who crossed very several disciplines, yes, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah, indeed. And what are your sources for creativity? Is it something active like reading scientific literature or is it something passive you see something it comes to you do you have any examples of your uh, your uh, sometimes story? i have to solve a problem uh, so when i started here was how to make microfluidics without having all the fabrication machine that they're required for making microfluidics mm -hmm. at the time i was also playing a lot with 3d printer and the two things came together. So, okay, I can use this for making PDMS microfluidics. That was mm -hmm. kind of uh, kind of new. Um, so sometimes it's for solving problem, and sometimes it's just out of the blue. I'm um, taking a shower. I'm doing something else. I say, ah, okay, this may be a good idea. I need to go to the lab and try it. Yeah. Um, and it's how completely do you make sure, random for me. <clears throat> how do you make sure that like? the thoughts in the shower you cannot work out right same as if you <laughs> at night dream something or so how do you make sure that you remember it that one i um i also have something to write on um actually i have it here if and it's practically this one was only one of of the many oh, nice but there are plenty of ideas and schemes and some random drawing um Probably Banu will come back with this a uh, little bit better later. But um, sometimes I just have an idea, I draw it there, and then I uh, think about it. Sometimes work, sometimes not. Um, 
those one for example were about os oscillation oscillative reaction ah, yes. they, they never worked uh, sometimes i have a molecule in mind that i want to synthesize mm -hmm. um, do you come back to it sometimes or is it uh... sometimes yes sometimes mm -hmm. it's nice um, this one was for example a conference in crete ah. <laughs> but uh, you just you must have something to 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 draw it and then to write your uh, stuff and yeah, it's a pity that now I'm using the iPad because sometimes I, I lose stuff on the iPad, but on the paper, I yeah. keep those things since, I don't know, this is uh, seven years old now? Yes, eight, eight years old. Yeah, that's the that's the pitfall of modern technology, right? Because the inscriptions yes. in stone are still uh, exactly. for thousands of years, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I think for me... How, um, yeah, exactly. Uh, what about you? How you get uh, creative? Yeah, one addition, I think, in, in addition to the things you mentioned, is um, discussions and interactions. I think it helps right. a lot to really discuss your problem, discuss your ideas, and then sometimes even the other person, only the listening to it and reflecting on it helps already. Sometimes the other person says like one word, and on that word triggers you to think in a completely new direction. So I think for me, these interactions with um, with collaborations or with students are really important too. I also had, for instance, sometimes students ask me a question to the to, uh, in the practical, and then, then I was like, ah, okay, that would be very interesting to implement in this ongoing research, you know. And then uh, that uh, yeah, that also uh, shows I think uh, how you can use the teaching as an inspiration, I guess. That's, that's sometimes beautiful because they are not biased and they are not super specialized. So sometimes they ask a question and you have never thought about that question. Yeah. Indeed. Ah, this is actually a good point. Indeed. And while we already know a very specialized thing, so we already have closed mind, while actually the students are way open-minded, uh, they are way open-minded than us. Yes, and that's, that's oh, really no, valuable, yeah, yes. Oh, yes, definitely. So sometimes they have questions, okay. This is a good question. Maybe you want to do the bachelor thesis in our lab yes. for solving the question. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's really nice. Huh? If you see that during the practical, for instance. Yeah, and I think this relates where I think we wanted to go in into some of the techniques which you could actively do. Um, that is this, what I said about the discussion, that is this associative thinking technique. You just try to, to make links by associations. You can also use mind maps to just, don't filter your thoughts, just write down everything in the mind maps, how it comes up, if you want a bit more structure. And then your example, Vito, uh, is actually look what other scientists did. And actually, Da Vinci himself is also reported to use a personal notebook for his ideas to develop them. So maybe you want to keep a small notebook and just not as a lab journal, but just write down your ideas and even draw in it when, whenever uh, something comes up or when you listen to a talk that can also help to, to associate the information from the talk to, to your own ideas. And then Definitely. I think one important part is, and that's why we are actually recording this podcast because we don't want to make a video lecture out of this. So everything except staying at your desk so uh, go into the nature, bike somewhere, listen to a podcast, doesn't have to be this one. Have an evening with uh, other students, for instance, everything to stop thinking about the problem uh, can help to, to just get a fresh mind on your, on your work or on your problem. And another uh, yeah, creative part we mentioned a few times is actually drawing. So for instance, if you draw, you focus on something else, and actually for today, we have a special guest who uh, will explain to us how creativity and drawing go together and how she finds her inspiration in uh, geometric figures and artwork. Okay, so for the third part of this podcast, uh, we have a special guest who is Banu. Uh, Banu is the founder of Banu Design. Uh, this is the brand under which she's creating art on porcelain. This art is called Dot Art and it's inspired by geometric figures. Banu, could you explain to us the Dot Art technique? 
Well, um, I, uh, I started actually with pen drawing and then uh, a few years ago I started painting on porcelain. Um, I started with dots because um, I had first to get to know the, the, the tools and the paint and dots are the e easiest figures. Um, and then I didn't know that there was a whole dot art kind of movement. So oh. that's how I started. So you started uh, by yourself before you actually know, knew that there was a kind of inspiration available, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, that's interesting. And how do you get the uh, inspiration for the dot art designs? Um, I, yeah, that can come from different kind of uh, images. Uh, the, the dot art is mostly uh, from my own fantasy because uh, yeah, it's very, uh, how do you say that, yeah, plain. So, or I have an example here. For the podcast listeners, what uh, Vano is showing is actually a, a plate, which is, uh, yeah, which is painted with this uh, dot art technique. So in different colors and with different uh, geometric shapes. Yes, when I start uh, painting a plate like this, I can either start in the center, like I did here, or in the exterior part. And then um, I just get inspired by the, the colors that I use and uh, using my own imagination. Um, when painting other geometric figures, I get inspired by different uh, external factors. And what kind of external factors would that be? Do you have an example? Um, yeah, of course, uh, that can be nature, like fractals or uh, buildings, um, especially windows in churches or yeah. the patterns they use in mosques, those kind of things. Okay. And also, the plate is, is sorry, Julia, one moment, but the yes, plate is extremely mathematical. How do you know how many, well, how do it place you have on the plate? Because that one, it's it's really uh, yeah. symmetrical. How do you do the symmetry by eye? Yeah, I often get this question, but uh, I, I'm an intuitive painter. So if you start uh, symmetric and you divide uh, the space in a symmetrical way, then it's always uh, geometric. Like, yeah, that's not, not only... Uh, uh, mathematical for me. Yes, I mean, it is. You probably don't know it and you do it automatically, but it's uh, extremely uh, mathematical, that uh, that symmetry. No, just a question. So what you do is you divide it first in a rough scaffold, so to say, and then you, you fill it in. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the, the difficult part for me is that I have to be careful that uh, with a lot of division that I uh, don't uh, overlook apart because then it's not too much for anymore <laughs> but uh yeah if you have a ruler and the paint then that's all i use and that actually leads to the next question so when you make your design do you have already a final vision of the plate in mind or do you rather develop it as you go along um it, I can work both ways. It depends on the, the object that I want to paint. Like uh, I have this smaller plate here. So this is, uh, um, just for the listeners, this is an oval uh, shaped plate, which you could use for cakes or cookies, uh, mainly in blue yes. colors, but also some gold I can see in there. Mm -hmm. um, with this plate, I just started on the exterior and I have a uh, um, specific uh, geometric uh, shapes that I use and by combining them you get a different pattern at a time but sometimes I use a, um, a pattern like an Islamic geometric pattern I have an example here I hope you can see it it's a tile and it's an old geometric shape out of the and I the, the lines first 
and afterwards decide which um, what I'm going to paint or which details I'm going to add. Okay, so but that looks much more. That looks already more complicated. This uh, so there. Do you, you first yes. uh, already make a, a sketch of the the lines? I assume right. Yeah, with these uh, Islamic geometric patterns, uh, I have to use a, a ruler. Um, with a lot of the other objects, I do it with my yeah you know, with freehand, mm -hmm. free stuff. But um, th these ones are very precise. And by combining the tiles in different ways, you get a different, bigger pattern. Okay. Oh, that's that's interesting. So it's actually like, um, you know, in the in the department we do supramolecular chemistry, where we have smaller building blocks and we combine them to larger. So it's actually a bit like that. You have your smaller tiles and you build them into a larger, uh, yeah, in, into a larger yeah. uh, artwork. Ah, yeah. And also, what I was also wondering uh, about the colors, uh, is there a difference there? Do you first determine which colors you're going to use, or could there also be a change as you go along? Uh, I have a preference for uh, certain colors, and it's uh, the blue, turquoise, and gold. Um, I sometimes use different colors, but these suit me the best, I think. And sometimes I start painting and then I'm like, where did I get this combination? And then I, I afterwards see that the books I sometimes use ah. <laughs> are the colors. So I unconsciously use the colors that I see on a book. Um, yeah. uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's very interesting. So that is something which, which you do not choose from a creative uh, point of view. You do not choose consciously, but it's really something which just kind of matches for you intuitively in that sense. Yes, yes, yeah. That's One question I had, because your designs are quite... Uh, complex. So, uh, do you allow yourself to make errors, and what do you do if you don't like a design? Um, that depends. When I do a pen drawing, like I have here, I have a, a square of a, a pen drawing, uh -huh. and when I draw on paper, uh, it's quite definitive. So if I make a mistake there, then I have to be extremely creative to camouflage the error because I want it to be geometric, a symmetric. Um, so if I can work around it, it's okay, or else I have to throw it all away. Um, but when I paint on porcelain, then uh, I don't allow errors. <laughs> then I just uh, take it off and start again. Ah, so you remove it and you start completely new. Yes. And do you well, not completely remove the paint. Ah, okay. And and but do you sometimes also have that you kind of did something like a a, a certain like a, let's say you look first at it that oh it's an error and then you try to implement it or do you prefer to then remove it? When I'm uh, painting on porcelain and the, the, the line is not straight or the dot is too big or the, the paint is not uh, drying up easily or the way I want, then I just remove it. Okay. Yeah. But how long it takes? I mean, how much, how much focus you need to put in this and how... Because I think it's really focus dependent, making all of those drawing in, in a perfect way. So you are completely in yourself and outside of the world, how does it work? So, and actually, when do you do it or? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I have, I have this thing, I can do it everywhere. I can do it downstairs on the kitchen table. I can do it when I'm completely alone or, um, but I have my own kind of bubble. And okay. um, it's the most important thing is that you know your tools and you know the paint because uh, if it's cold outside, it affects my paint, the, how much time it takes to dry, or it's, it's very precise. And if you know the, the tools and the materials and the external factors, then it's just uh, adaptation. 
And if you do it for a long time, it goes automatically. Okay. I, I see a lot of parallels to also research. Yes, with science well. and research. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, when you have something sensitive to temperature. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. You're doing a lot yeah. of science without, yeah, uh, without knowing that you're doing science. <laughs> without knowing. Yeah, that's why I always use, <laughs> that's why I always use uh, this stick. It's just a wooden stick to paint. Uh, that's the only tool I use for painting. Um, because even the way the, the paint attaches to the wood is different than when you, you have a, an iron, a stick from iron or something. So it's very precise. Wow. Yeah, very, very nice to see all these uh, parallels, I would say, indeed. And uh, I think that uh, maybe brings me to my uh, last question. Um, do you sometimes get very unexpected new inspiration, which makes you try a completely new technique? Um, well, sometimes I uh, like to uh, say that, um, um, give myself a challenge, because what I do on porcelain, I've been doing for many years, so it's uh, automatic. Well, I recently started uh, making drawings of, uh, with graphic uh, designs, like uh, with a drawing program and a drawing tablet, um, just to um, stimulate my inspiration. And by using different kinds of tools and materials, it also affects my uh, porcelain painting. Ah, uh -huh. oh, that's interesting. That's so actually you, the yeah. same things that Julia was saying before, when you have to broaden your spectrum, uh, both as a scientist and as an artist. You need to learn different things and then you can integrate them in your own uh, either design or research, but it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. No, I was just wanting to say that uh, I do think that before you start uh, exploring, that the, the, the main activity has to be, the uh, you have to be, your very best at what your main activity is so you can implement it or else it gets scattered if you know what i mean that's, i think that julia will yes. have a, will have a podcast on focus as well and this is exactly the difference <laughs> between doing too many things and also or focus i think there should be a balance somewhere which i still have to find but uh, there should be a balance somewhere yeah, indeed. But what is also very interesting that you 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 experiment with new materials and new methods to implement it later in the porcelain painting part. But you don't, uh, as I understand, at least correct me if I'm wrong, you don't uh, have already the application for your porcelain art in mind. You only know, OK, if I broaden my scope here, it will affect my porcelain painting. but it's not that you use a different technique in order to precisely implement this one skill into your porcelain painting, right? No, because when I paint on porcelain, that's my comfort zone. I know everything that I need to know about it. And by exploring the unknown, you don't know what you're going to expect beforehand. So that's the, the uncertainty uh, that's in there. So, uh, yeah. Thanks a lot. Bano for this very insightful interview. It was really, really striking to me how much parallels there were to our first part. So uh, yeah, I hope also that the students enjoy this, uh, this podcast. So maybe to conclude, what did we learn in this episode? In this episode, we first talked about why do we need creativity and what is creativity? So maybe uh, some of the aspects were interesting for you or something for you to reflect on. Then we uh, talked about how to implement creativity and what are some techniques we could apply. And finally, we had a very interesting conversation with Banu, who taught us a lot about uh, the complementaries and the similarities between art and science. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode and the next episode will be about focus. 
The soundtrack to this podcast is called New Beautiful Day by Winnie the Mook. And please visit the show notes for the links for filmmusic.io.